We come this evening in our study of the ninth chapter of the Epistle to the Romans to the words that are to be found in verses 10 to 13. Verses 10 to 13 in the ninth chapter of Paul's Epistle to the Romans. And not only this, but when Rebekah also had conceived by one, even by our father Isaac, for the children being not yet born, neither having done any good or evil, that the purpose of God according to election might stand, not of works, but of him that calleth, it was said unto her, The elder shall serve the younger. As it is written, Jacob have I loved, but Esau have I hated. Now, we are here, of course, continuing this um, great argument that the apostle is developing at this point. And it's important that we should bear in our minds what he is uh, setting out to do. The argument, of course, is over this whole matter of uh, the position of the Jews regarded as a nation with respect to the gospel of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. But indeed, even that is not the main object. The main object is this, that that state and condition of the Jews seems to disprove what the Apostle had been arguing and stating so eloquently in the 8th chapter, from verse 28 to the end of the chapter, so that we keep it in that perspective. The fundamental statement is that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to his purpose. And we've seen how he worked that out. But now here is the case of the Jews which seems to contradict that. Because that they were God's people is perfectly clear. And the apostle reminds us of that in verses 4 and 5 in which he gives us a list of their extraordinary privileges because they were the people of God. Very well. And it looks on the surface as if there's a contradiction here and as if the apostle had gone too far in emphasizing this note to the final perseverance of the saints and the absolute certainty of the fulfillment of God's purpose in all his people. Now, that's the thing he takes up. And he starts off by saying, therefore, in verse 6, not as though the word of God had taken none effect, not as though the word of God had fallen down, not as though the purpose of God uh, stated in his word had broken down and had failed in operation. Very well. Uh, why, how, how is he going to demonstrate this? Well, his fundamental proposition is that they are not all Israel that are of Israel. And you remember how he, we have seen that he works that out. He proves it like this. He does so, first of all, by putting actual facts before them. And the first fact, the one we've already considered, is the whole story of Isaac and Ishmael a story that was, of course, well known uh, to the Jews. That alone is sufficient to prove that all the seed of Abraham are not involved in the purpose of God, that all the seed of Abraham are not his children, as the apostle shows us here in detail. But we've seen not only that he gives us the fact, but he gives us the explanation of that fact and shows us the very deep significance of that fact. And the significance we saw was this that there are children and children. There are natural children and what he calls the children of the promise. Now, this is his argument, that the purpose of God has reference only to those who are the children of the promise. It is only in these that God's purpose is carried out and in nobody else. We saw further that God produces these children himself. He did so in the case of Isaac. The birth of Isaac was a miracle. And God produced Isaac, gave this power to Abram and to Sarah to produce him. And God did so because it was his purpose, his plan, that his great promise to Abram and through Abram's seed should not be carried out through Ishmael, but through Isaac. So Isaac was produced in order to carry out the purpose and in order to guarantee that it should be carried out. 
So that we ended by pointing out that the promises are only to the spiritual seed. The promises are only to those who are born of the Spirit. They are born of the flesh, of course, like everybody else. But what separates them and makes them unique is that they are also born of the Spirit, as the Apostle works out in Galatians 4 towards the end. Very well, then. All to whom the promises apply in all ages and generations and at all times are of necessity, therefore, clearly, as Isaac was, children were born of the Spirit. And so, any believer, any Christian, is ultimately only to be explained in terms of God's action and God's activity and God's interference in the natural process whereby they have become human beings. It is not the natural, therefore, that matters. It is God's supernatural interference in the natural. Now, that is a summary of the point at which we've arrived. All that was stated in verses 6 to 9, ending with that most important statement, for this is the word of promise. At, that, at this time will I come, and Sarah shall have a son. Very well. Now then, the argument continues. And the apostle continues it in these words. And not only this. Not only that, he says, that isn't my only case. That isn't all I've got to say. He's got something further to say. And here he introduces the case of the two sons of Isaac and Rebekah. Esau and Jacob. This is going to add to the proof that he's already given. So he says not only this, there is more. But now we must ask a question at this point. Why does he add anything further? Why doesn't he content himself with the case of Isaac and Ishmael, which seems to be a conclusive case? The thing he's setting out to prove is that they're not all Israel that are of Israel. And the case of Isaac and of Ishmael really does that in and of itself once and forever. Both of them were the sons of Abram, but it is Isaac alone who is the true spiritual seed in whom the promise and the purpose are to be carried out. Why then add this further case? Well, the answer is, of course, that the Apostle Paul was uh, a master debater. He was also, in addition, the incomparable teacher. And it is a part of the business of any teacher to try to forestall difficulties and problems that will arise in the minds of those who are listening to him. It's a very poor teacher who just makes a positive statement and leaves it at that. The test of a good teacher is the number of negatives he uses, and furthermore, the number of possible objections that he deals with before people have even thought of them. That's the test of a first-class teacher and debater. And the Apostle Paul is in a category entirely on his own. He is supreme in both respects. He never takes any risks in these matters. He states his case, he then puts up the difficulties, the oppositions, the objections, and deals with them and demolishes them. We've seen him doing that at great length already in earlier parts of the epistle, and particularly did we see it at the end of chapter 8. Well, now he's doing the same thing again. What are the difficulties or the objections that he anticipates. Well, here is one of them. Somebody might come forward and say, well, that's all right, uh, we know about Isaac and Ishmael, but uh, that, of course, doesn't prove anything. Why not? Well, for this reason. That though they had the same father, they hadn't got the same mother. And after all, Ishmael's mother, Hagar, was uh, not a, an Israelite at all, not a Jewess, she was a pagan, and uh, furthermore, she was a servant and a slave. So that it's quite obvious that Ishmael, being the child of this pagan slave, and not in the true line of Israel, mother as well as father, it was obvious that he was laid aside and not chosen, and that Isaac, who was born of Sarah, who was in the same line and who belonged to these peculiar people of God, it is quite natural and obvious that uh, Isaac was the one to be chosen. That's perfectly clear. 
they would say. But our argument is that all who are descended of Isaac, who comes in the true line, must surely still be the people of God. And it was the case of the Jews that they were the descendants of Isaac as well as of Abraham. Their boast was their fathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Well now then, the apostle here in these verses deals with this objection and this particular difficulty. And he deals with it, as I've already said, in a, matter that is, in a manner that is complete and quite final and conclusive. How does he do it? Well, it's very interesting to notice that he adopts precisely the same method as he did in the previous argument in verses uh, 7, 8, and 9. You remember that he did three things there. He states a fact. He quotes a, an explicit statement of God. And he deduces the doctrine. Now, we've seen him doing that in the previous instance. He takes up this... Um, a statement of fact in dealing with these two children of Abraham. You notice also that he, he quotes, In Isaac shall thy seed be called, and he also quotes, At this time will I come, and Sarah shall have a son. And then he has his own doctrinal explanation. They which are the children, that is, they which are the children of the flesh, these are not the children of God, but the children of the promise, are counted for the seed. That's the doctrine. And it's interesting to notice that he puts that in the middle. Now he does exactly the same thing here. Not only that, he says, but when Rebecca also had conceived by one, even by our father Isaac, there's your fact. Then you've got the statement, uh, the explicit statements of God in verses 12 and 13. It was said unto her, the elder shall serve the younger, as it is written, Jacob have I loved, but Esau have I hated. Two quotations of statements made by God. And then in between them, in verse 11, the apostle presents his doctrine, which he deduces from the facts and the word of God as he has put them before us. Very well. Now then, let's follow him as he makes these three points here, as he did in the first case that he adduces. First of all, the facts. He uh, reminds them that um, Rebecca had uh, two children. Now, there was only one mother here. There were two mothers in the previous case, Sarah and Hagar. But now there's only one, Rebecca. Just uh, the one mother of the two sons, Esau and Jacob. But it's very interesting. And I must emphasize this because it's in line with what we saw last week before the interesting details that we are given about Rebecca. Did you notice them in the reading at the beginning in the 25th chapter of the book of Genesis? What we are told is this. Verse 21. And Isaac entreated the Lord for his wife because she was barren. And the Lord was entreated of him. And Rebecca, his wife, Conceived. You see the parallel with the case of Sarah, who also was barren and who was troubled by that fact. But God intervened, and she had this son called Isaac. Here is exactly the same thing. Rebecca was barren and was troubled by that fact. And Isaac entreated the Lord for his wife because she was barren. And the Lord was entreated of him, and Rebekah, his wife, conceived. The conceiving was the result of the Lord being entreated and acting by way of reply to the prayer that was offered to him. So that we can say again of the birth of these two sons, Esau and Jacob, what we were able to say about the birth of Isaac, that it is as the result of the intervention of God. Now, that's the general statement with regard to how it came to pass that Rebecca ever had a child at all. Right? That, that is the statement with regard to Rebecca. Then he says, in order to bring out his point, of course, Rebecca also had conceived by one. 
In the case we are considering, there was one and the same mother, but there was also one and the same father. He troubles to say that. And you see, he does so solely for the purposes of his argument. He might have said, Rebecca uh, conceived uh, by our father Isaac. But he wants to emphasize this one. Because people are objecting and saying there were two mothers in the first case. All right, he says, now in this case, there was one father for the two boys, the same mother also for the two boys. One in both instances is something that is emphasized. And it's another interesting point in passing to notice how he puts himself in again. He's anxious to try and win these Jews if he can. He says, by our father Isaac. He was a Jew himself. So he puts himself in with the Jews and there reminds them that uh, they always prided themselves in the fact that they were not only the children of Abram, but also of Isaac and also of Jacob. The three fathers were always mentioned together. And that was the proud claim of the Jews. So the apostle is anxious to state the case as pleasantly as he can and in as appealing a manner as he can in order that his argument will be still more effective. Very well, there's the first thing. One father, one mother. But then there's another interesting point here, something which is very wonderful. And that is that in this case, they happen to be twins. They were in their mother's womb at the same time. This makes the case still more interesting. Before, in the case of Ishmael and Isaac, Ishmael had been born a number of years before Isaac was ever born. But here, in order to emphasize this fact of the unity of the natural, it is the case that they were actually in the womb and born of the womb of Rebecca at exactly the same time. Yet, Inevitably, one was actually born in time just a little before the other. And it happens that the one who was born first was Esau, the one whose bodily condition was described to us. Nevertheless, though of the twins Esau was the one who first appeared in the world, Jacob is nevertheless the one through whom the seed is to be perpetuated. Now that is the fact concerning this case. And, of course, the apostle here has a very powerful and striking case. Because Esau was the father of the people who became known as the Edomites. And all of you who are familiar with your Old Testament will know the trouble that the Edomites constantly gave to the Jews and the attitude of the Jews towards the Edomites. They despised them. They hated them. So here is a very powerful case. The apostle knows the attitude of the Jews towards the Edomites. And what he's really saying in effect to them is this. You see, he said, the Edomites, you were old, traditional, hated enemies, were born of exactly the same father and mother as your father, Jacob. That makes his argument extremely powerful. Well, he sets the facts before them in that way. And the conclusion, of course, that is implied is quite inevitable. It cannot possibly, therefore, be a matter of natural descent. There is an Israel and an Israel. They're not all Israel that are of Israel. They're not all truly of Isaac, who are the children of Isaac, or the sons of Isaac. This case of Esau and Jacob proves it quite conclusively. The Edomites and the Jews appear as opposites, though they have come ultimately and originally from precisely the same father and mother, and were in that mother's womb at precisely the same time. Very well, there is his statement of fact, with the implied conclusion. But then we must look at the specific statements of God that he quotes. Now, don't ask me why it was that the apostle pushed in here in verse 11 in brackets his doctrine. He did that sort of thing. He does it quite often. It may be a defect in style, but there it is. That's how he has done it. But in order to get this thing clear in our minds, let's take it in this other way. Let's look at his quotation of God's specific statements first. He reminds us that God said to Rebecca, you remember Rebecca, when she found that she was to have twins, she went 
to God and said, if it be so, why am I thus? And God gave her the answer. He said, there are two nations and two peoples in you, and they're going to be very different. But this, he said, is the most striking thing of all. The elder shall serve the younger. That is a statement made by God to Rebecca, and don't lose sight of this fact, that God said that to Rebecca before the children were born. While they were still in the womb and unborn, God made that statement to her about the fact that Esau, the one who was actually born first, was going to serve the one who was born second. Now that you will find, of course, in Genesis 25, 23. But then he has a further quotation. As it is written, Jacob have I loved, but Esau have I hated. This is added in order to give us an explanation of the first quotation. And here, of course, the apostle is quoting from the prophet Malachi. And he is quoting from the first chapter of the prophet Malachi. And these are the words. Let me read to you the first three verses of the first chapter of the prophet Malachi. The burden of the word of the Lord to Israel by Malachi. I have loved you, saith the Lord. Yet you say, wherein hast thou loved us? Was not Esau Jacob's brother, saith the Lord? Yet I loved Jacob, and I hated Esau, and laid his mountains and his heritage waste for the dragons of the wilderness. Whereas Edom saith, we are impoverished, but we will return and build the desolate places. Thus saith the Lord of hosts, they shall build, but I will throw down, and they shall call them the border of wickedness, and the people against whom the Lord hath indignation forever. And your eyes shall see, and ye shall say, the Lord will be magnified from the border of Israel. Now this is a particularly pregnant and uh, pertinent quotation for the apostle to make. Now let's examine the terms. Jacob have I loved, but Esau have I hated. Now it seems perfectly clear that uh, these words must not be taken in their absolute sense. People have often stumbled at this uh, term here, hated. Esau have I hated. Surely this is a term that must be interpreted here in the, li in the light of what we read, for instance, in a statement made by our Lord, which is recorded in the 14th chapter of the Gospel according to St. Matthew. Listen to these words in verse 26. Luke 24, Luke 24. Luke 14, verse 26. We are told that our Lord turned and said unto the great multitudes which followed him, If any man come to me and hate not his father and mother and wife and children and brethren and sisters, yea, and his own life also, he cannot be my disciple. Now there's the same word. If any man come unto me and hate not, his father and mother. Well, now, obviously, that is not meant to be taken in its literal and absolute sense of hatred. What our Lord is indicating is a relative attitude. What he means is that if you put anybody before me, he says, you can't be my disciple. You have, as it were, to regard even your nearest and dearest in a lesser light and even as a hindrance and an obstacle to you if they would insinuate themselves between you and me. You hate what they're doing, you hate what they are in that respect only. You don't hate them as persons. Now there is no question about this. Let me quote to you the words of Charles Hodge, who seemed to me would seem to me to put this very perfectly. He says, Hate means to love less and to regard and treat with less favour. It is in that sense this word here must be interpreted, as in Luke 14, 26. Very well then, here is the explanation 
of why it is that Esau is going to serve Jacob, though Esau is actually born before Jacob. It is because of God's attitude towards him. God's favor is on Jacob, not on Esau. That, are, that, that is the relative position that they occupy face to face with God. I don't stop to indicate here, because I'll have to do so later, that this is not a reference merely to the subsequent history of the descendants of Esau and the descendants of Jacob. It's not mere reference to the subsequent history of uh, the, the Edomites and the Jews, and that God blessed the Jews and not the Edomites. It includes that. But the thing starts away back when Esau and Jacob were actually in Rebekah's womb. It is because of what God had determined there that Esau and Jacob are in their relative positions and there is this striking difference between the Edomites and the Israelites in all their subsequent history. Now, that is the whole purpose of what Malachi says there. That is the whole argument that Esau, that, that Malachi is putting before those children of Israel. He was writing to the Israelites and he says, why are you behaving like this? He says, you are the people whom God has loved. You are the descendants of Jacob. And God has set his affection upon you. Why do you treat God in the way in which you do? That's the whole purpose of Malachi's argument at that particular point. Very well then. Here now then we are looking at the two quotations and we draw this conclusion. It is the same once more. The, the distinction between Esau and Jacob, Edomites and Israelites, is a distinction that has been drawn by God himself. He said so before they were born, and he repeated it through his prophet Malachi. He sets his affection on Jacob, not on Esau. He does so before they are born. He even tells us what he, he tells us what he is doing. He made his statement to Rebekah. He made his statement uh, through Malachi, and he makes it quite clear that he is doing this in order to carry out his great purpose. Very well. There's the second argument. The specific statements made by God, not only with respect to what he is doing, but as to why he is doing it. And that brings us then to the third section, the third argument, which is the doctrine or the theological significance of the facts and God's statements with respect to the facts. Now then, this is the thing that the Apostle puts in brackets in verse 11. For the children being not yet born neither having done any good or evil, that the purpose of God according to election might stand, not of works, but of him that calleth. Now, this is a, an extraordinary statement. The apostle sets out to make a complete statement, and he doesn't do so. Now, it's on this ground that he's often criticized as being a bad stylist. This is what is called an anachalutham. In other words, he doesn't complete a thing. He interrupts his own statement and says something else. Now, there's no need for me to defend the Apostle Paul, but the defense is this, that he really does tell us what he wants to say, but he doesn't put it in the form of a balanced statement as he originally intended. What I mean is this. When you start off by saying, for the children not being yet born, neither having done any good or evil, that the purpose of God according to election might stand, well, then you expect some further statement to balance that. He doesn't give us that. He says, not of works, but of him that calleth. Now, if you're interested primarily, of course, in style and in eloquence and balanced statements and form, well, you can say that the apostle is a little bit defective in that respect. But the apostle was not concerned with that. He was concerned with truth and with the statement of truth. And the statement of truth of course, is sufficient and quite complete in and of itself. Well, let's look at it. He puts it here, I say, in these brackets. Now we can say this, that uh, there was no absolute necessity for him to give us this doctrine at all. If he was simply out to prove that they are not all Israel, that are of Israel, well, he's done so to the hilt. Isaac and Ishmael 
Esau and Jacob prove it beyond any question. The facts are enough in and of themselves. We've got the statement of God on top of it. Yes, but the apostle is anxious that we should understand why God has done all this. In other words, he is concerned to put over the doctrine. So he brings it in here as he did in the previous argument. The apostle, I say, is ultimately concerned with this larger matter of the purpose of God. So he explains that. He wants us to understand it. He wants us to understand the significance of these facts that he's putting before us. Because after all, the facts are nothing but illustrations of the outworking of a great principle. Now then, you notice that I'm putting it in different ways. I started off by saying tonight that the big thing is the purpose of God, not these details. The details are simply illustrations to prove and to show the outworking of the purpose. This is the big thing. So we must have doctrine. Paul never stops at facts alone. He is always interested in our understanding the truth, the principle. And now he's going to put it before us. And what he says is this. What God did in the case of, in the case of Esau and of Jacob was not something haphazard. It wasn't something capricious. It wasn't something that he did merely out of a whim. He did it, he tells us, because it was a part of his great purpose and plan, which is always carried out by means of the principle of election, or selection, or choice. Now then, that's what he's really telling us here. The children, he says, being not yet born, neither having done any good or evil, That in order that the purpose of God according to election might stand. Then, this is simply saying it again in a negative form, not of works, but of him that calleth. Now then, you see the the fundamental proposition is this. God carries out his great purpose by means of and through this process of election. He's saying nothing new here. He's only repeating what he's already told us in chapter 8 in verses 28, 29, and 30. Listen. Romans 8, 28 to 30. We know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to his purpose. Called according to his purpose. Now then, what is this purpose? Well, here it is. This is how he works it out. God's purpose is worked out in this way. Whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his Son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Leave that out for a moment. Whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate. Moreover, whom he did predestinate, them he also called. And whom he called, them he also justified. And whom he justified, them he also glorified. There's the statement of it. What matters, he says, is God's purpose. All things are going to work together for good to those who are in God's purpose. How do we know this? How can we be guaranteed? Well, he says, you can be certain of it like this. That these people are in God's purpose because God has foreknown them, and because he's foreknown them, he's predestinated them, and because he's predestinated them, he's called them, and because he's called them, he's justified them, and because he's justified them, he's glorified them. I'm not going over that again. We spent a lot of time on it. But that's the statement. He's saying exactly the same thing here in smaller compass. The children being not yet born, neither having done any good or evil, in order that the purpose of God, according to election, might stand. Exactly the same thing. Now then, let me explain it, expound it to you. You notice the way he puts it. The children being not yet born. The time element is a very important one and a very vital factor in the argument. Something happened to these before they were born. Neither having done any good or evil, well, that makes it still stronger. They are not born, well, because they're not born, they can't have done anything, and they haven't done anything. They were not yet born. But what he says is this. God chose Jacob rather than Esau before either of them was born, and before either of them had a chance of doing either good or evil. That's the statement. That is simply sheer fact. He said to Rebecca, look here, the younger, the, the younger is going to be served by the older, or the older is going to serve the younger. Before either of them was born, God determined that and God said that. 
But now here's the question. Why did God do this? Why did God set his affection on Jacob rather than Esau before either of them was born and before either of them had done anything at all? Why? And he gives us the answer, that, which means in order that. Now, here's the reason. He did it in order that his purpose and object might be carried out. How? Well, you can look at it like this. God's purpose is something that is worked out through this process of election. The purpose of God according to election. Now, according to means, by means of, or through. God's purpose is worked out by using this principle of election, or choice, or selection. That's what he's saying. That's how God's purpose is brought to pass. It's worked out on the principle of, or by means of, or by the instrumentality of, election. Now, this word election is an interesting one. It is a word we are told by the authorities that had only been used previously in Jewish literature in one book, the Psalms of Solomon. It means a process of choice. It means a process of selection. I make this point about the word because it is perfectly clear here that we are dealing with something that was very specially revealed by God through the Spirit to the Apostle Paul. He is not taking up uh, something that had been revealed very plainly in the Old Testament. This is something that has been given to him in a peculiar way, so he uses this word in order to bring out his teaching. It is a process of choice, a process of selection. Now, what is the object? Well, he says it's this. God works out his purpose through this principle or method of election and se or selection for this reason that it is the only way whereby this process and purpose can be made certain and sure, that the purpose of God according to election might stand. Now then, here's the thing. And might stand is a very good translation. Now, numbers of you, I have no doubt, are using this translation, which is called the Amplified New Testament and which, speaking generally, I wouldn't hesitate to say, is excellent. This is one of the few instances in which it's really poor and misleading. It translates it like this. In order further to carry out God's purpose, that isn't what it means at all. It doesn't mean further to carry out God's purpose. It means in order that God's purpose might stand. Now, Grimm Thayer in their lexicon are quite clear about this. They say the word means to continue. To continue to be, that's to say they go on not to perish. It means to last, to endure, to continue, to stand, to remain firm. And of course it must mean that. Don't you see, it's the exact opposite of what he's said in, or put into the mouth of the objectors at the beginning of verse 6. Yes, the beginning of the whole statement. Not as though the word of God had fallen down. Not as though the word of God had fallen down. Well, what is it that makes certain that the word of God will not fall down but stand and be firm and secure? Oh, it is, he says, that God's purpose is always carried out through the process of election. That's the argument. The standing of verse 11 is the exact opposite of the taking none effect or the falling down or failing of verse 6. Very well, then, here is this most important statement that he makes. That God's purpose, I say, is made sure and certain through this process of election. And in order to make quite sure that none of us is still muddled about this, he goes on and doesn't complete what he had originally intended, obviously, but again, as a good teacher, he says, look here, let me make it clear and certain to you, not of works, but of him that calleth. This process of selection, he says, got nothing to do with works. You see, he uses a negative and a, and a positive. It's not of the works of men. So this shuts out once and forever that the purpose of God through election is something that works out simply through God foreseeing that certain people are going to do good works. 
There are some people who try to get rid of foreknowledge, you remember, by saying that. That all Paul is saying is, whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate. It means, they say, that God having all knowledge, he was able to see ahead of time what certain people were going to do, that some were going to do good works and believe and others were not. It's all right, says Paul, it isn't. It's got nothing to do with works at all, not of works. And in any case, it can't be, he says, because these two were not capable of doing anything. They were not yet born and they'd neither done works, either good or bad. But he repeats it for the sake of emphasis. It's not that God foresees our good works. He says it's got nothing to do with works at all. Works are entirely shut out. And then, to emphasize it further, he puts it positively. It is not of works, but it is altogether and entirely of him that calleth. In other words, this purpose of God is worked out through election entirely as the result of the action and the activity of God himself. It is completely independent of anything in us. Our birth, our nationality, our good works, or anything else whatsoever. And the cases he has given us, of course, prove it to the hilt. It was God who produced Isaac. It was God who produced both Jacob and Esau. But then having produced the two, he had already selected the one, even before either was born. So the purpose of God is carried out in the case of Jacob. In other words, what he's saying is this, it's not a works, it's of him that calleth. It is of him that calls things that are not as if they were. It is him that calls into being. People like Isaac and so on, it is all this calling of God. It is all of him that calleth. It is nothing of men at all. It is God's free choice. It is an absolute and a sovereign choice. That God should act in this way and choose and produce his own people is the only way in which his purpose can be surely and infallibly carried out and stand. That's what he's really saying. And you know, he's already said it before. He said it in chapter 4 in verse 16. You remember this. Winding up his great argument about justification by faith only, he makes this most vital statement. And thank God I can look back at the time when I emphasized it with all the force of which I'm capable. Therefore it is of faith in order that it might be by grace to the end that the promise might be sure to all the seed. There it is, exactly the same thing. It is of faith that it might be by grace to the end with the object, the intention, the ultimate purpose that the promise might be made sure, that the promise might stand, that the promise might not fall, that the promise might not be of no effect. That's why it is of faith, in order that it all might be of grace. And it is all of grace, in order that it may be sure, in order that it may be certain. And he's saying exactly the same thing here. If it depended upon anything in us, it would fail for certain. If our salvation and our ultimate glorification at any point or in any way depended upon us, it would certainly fail. But he says it doesn't depend upon us. In order that the purpose of God according to election might stand, God chooses Jacob and not Esau. Before either of them was born and before either of them had done any good or evil. It is an entirely independent action of God. And it is not dependent in any way upon us or anything we have done or can do or ever will do or anything about us at all. It is entirely of him that calleth. And it works in this way because this is the only way in which we can be certain and sure that we are going to be finally glorified. It is of faith that it might be by grace, in order that the promise might be sure to all the seed. What guarantees it to every single member of this family of God is that it is God who's working it out. And that, what he's, that is what he's been proving by his two cases. Isaac, as we have seen, would never have been born at all if God hadn't produced it. God said, at this time will I come 
and Sarah shall have a son. And it was the result of God's coming that produced Isaac. It's exactly the same in the case of Jacob. This is God's action and God's action alone. The thing is guaranteed and makes certain because it in no way depends upon us but is entirely the result of the free, sovereign action of Almighty God. Very well. There now then is the statement of the argument and we'll have to leave it at that for this evening. I've got my conclusions here. I mustn't keep you. I'm anxious to put them before you carefully and taking time to do so. I hope therefore next Friday evening to put before you the conclusions and the deductions which we draw from this threefold argument that the Apostle uses at this point. And then we shall try to consider some objections which are brought against these conclusions or if you prefer it we shall try to look at some other ways that men have attempted to interpret the statement of these important verses that we've been examining together. Let us pray. O oh Lord our God, we come to thank Thee once more for all the trouble that Thou dost take with us. We marvel that Thou didst ever cause Thy servants to write words such as these, and we can see why Thou hast done so, O Lord. Thou dost desire us as thy people to know that we are saved, to know how we are saved, to know the security of our salvation. O oh God, we thank thee for thine infinite condescension, that thou dost stoop to our level, that though thou art sovereign Lord and dost act in thy sovereign majesty, thou dost nevertheless deal very tenderly with thy children, with those whom thou dost call and adopt and make thy people. And we thank thee that thou dost thus provide us with an understanding of our whole position, that we can thus be delivered from the assaults of the enemy and all the false teachings and heresies that are round and about us, that we may know what we believe as well as in whom we have believed. Lord, receive our humble praise for the riches of thy grace and especially in this matter of the scriptures and the way thou didst cause thy servant to work out this argument and to put it before us plainly and clearly and cogently. O oh Lord, enable us, we pray thee, to understand it and to lay hold upon it, that we may rejoice in it as we ought, but above all, that we may give unto thee and unto thee alone all the praise and the honor and the glory, and gladly acknowledge and confess that we are what we are, entirely and solely, by the grace of God. Hear us, O Lord, in this our prayer. And now, may the grace of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship and the communion of the Holy Spirit abide and continue with us now this night throughout the remainder of this our short and certain earthly life and pilgrimage and until we shall know ourselves safely in the glory everlasting. Amen. We do hope that you've been helped by the preaching of Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones. All of the sermons contained within the MLJ Trust audio library are now available for free download. You may share the sermons or broadcast them. However, because of international copyright, please be advised that we are asking first that these sermons never be offered for sale by a third party. And second, that these sermons will not be edited in any way for length or to use as audio clips. You can find our contact information on our website at mljtrust.org. That's mljtrust.org.